you know, with proper grammar. So, always look it up, educate yourself. Any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. How, how can you tell if it's independent or dependent? Okay, like, no. An in, a dependent clause cannot stand alone because it's, it's lacking a subject or a predicate or a complete thought, right? If it's independent, it has all three of those, a subject, a predicate, and a complete thought. If you put a certain word in front of a dependent clause, like if or because, or when. So if you say the door was shut, the door is your subject, was is your verb, and shut is your complete thought. The door was shut. But if you put a, a word in front of that because the door was shut, now it doesn't have a complete thought. I feel that I'm hanging there. I'm waiting for you to finish what you were saying, right? 
And so because we put that word because there, we've made an independent clause that had a subject, a predicate, and a complete thought. Now we've made it not have a complete thought. And now it is a fragment or a, de a dependent clause. It needs, dependent clauses are needy, like dependent people, it needs help to be a full sentence, right? So if we say because the door was shut, comma, they couldn't get in. Well now I've got a nice long um, sentence that can stand on its own because I've linked my dependent clause with an independent clause. I see a lot of fragments in writing now. I think it's just because they're not hiring as many editors and the staff of all these newspapers and magazines has shrunken so much because of everyone's going online for their news. And I see a lot of run-on sentences where it's two independent clauses right next to each other and there's no comma and there's nothing. It just goes on and on for infinity and then they put a period. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Is no one editing this? You know, and that's okay like in novel writing or in poetry. I, I don't think it's okay in novel writing, but we could let people get away with funny punctuation if it's, you know, artistically fictional, whatever, but not in magazine writing. Things that are supposed to be full of facts and abiding by these grammar rules and clear, right? And, and one reason that you need all this stuff is for clarity. Because if you don't put the comma in, you can have, um, the reader can get lost. The reader cannot understand what's going on. Let's eat grandma. Let's eat grandma. <laughs> like if you don't put the comma in, right. it sounds like you're going to eat grandma. Yeah. But if you say let's eat comma grandma, then you're dressing grandma and no one's a cannibal and we get it, right? <laughs> so your readers are going to stumble if you're not using punctuation the correct way. You know, you've all heard the rule about don't start a sentence with because. Well, you can if you're putting a dependent clause in front of an independent clause. I was just about to ask you that question. Yeah. That you did. So if I say because the door was shut, period. First of all, it's a fragment, but the reader's like, what because the door was shut? What were you trying to tell me, right? But if you say, because the door was shut, comma, they could not get in, well, it's a fine sentence. It's a good sentence. You're showing a cause and effect. That's nice. There's all different kinds of sentences. Cause and effect sentences, sentences that define something, sentences that explain the correlation between two ideas. If you look down at your um, chart, ways to punctuate two independent clauses, if you want to take your sentences to the next level, look at the conjunctive adverbs. All these conjunctive adverbs, therefore, however, for example, consequently, they all are showing a relationship between the first part of your sentence and the second part of your sentence. I mean, you could say and for all those, right? You could say the door was shut, comma, and they couldn't get in. You can say that. That's a correctly punctuated, correctly written sentence. But it's better to say the door was shut, comma, so they couldn't get in. See, there's a cause and effect. Or to say the door was shut, semicolon, therefore, comma, they couldn't get in. So it's, this caused this. Or the door was shut, semicolon, as a result, comma, they couldn't get in. It's really nice to use these conjunctive adverbs that show you the relationship between things, especially when you get into writing about spiritual truths because there, it's harder to explain why did this person change? What helped this person go to the next level with God? What helped this person see their mistakes? What helped? And you're starting to get into really complex thought and you need complex sentence structures. All her life she had felt um, as if she had been searching for something, um, semicolon, however, and now you're learning the reader. This is what she felt like. However, I'm about to flip it around. That day she found Jesus and her purpose in life. Will it be however common? Well, conjunctive adverbs, because they're such a powerful tool in the middle of your sentence, they need two punctuation marks. So they need a semicolon. If you look at the chart, you'll see it has a semicolon, conjunctive adverb, and then comma. Gotcha. And that's probably the most complicated as far as punctuation with the conjunctive adverbs. So you would say, all her life she had been searching for something, semicolon, however, comma, she found Jesus and her purpose in life, or whatever your sentence was. And you, you kind of need all that together, really to, to show the relationship between before and after. I mean, you could break it into two. All her life she'd been searching for something, period. 
that day she found Jesus and her purpose for life. You can write it that way. That's totally legitimate way to write that. But if you want it to all be together because, and, and maybe you, you want a long sentence there because you had a short sentence and now you want a long sentence, like you can do it this way, you know? And these words, even the fanboys, and nor but, but is a really powerful one. The funny thing about but is that it's a, con it's a contrast word. So is um, however, and on the other hand, those are all contrast words words. They're all in your chart, right? And so if I'm going to use the word but, then the two things before and after it should contradict each other, right? Um, I love God, but he loves me. That's not really a contrast. Like those two things don't seem to oppose each other. You're just throwing that in there, you know, and, and really they, they need a different word, you know, um, like at the same time might have been what they were looking for. I love God, um, semicolon, at the same time, comma, he also loves me, or whatever. Sometimes people think, oh, well, just let the editors deal with the punctuation and the grammar, but there are writing choices being made by how you're punctuating and what kind of words you're using to join ideas together, and, and it, you can change the meaning. Like, an editor can go in, like, when I'm editing someone's stuff, I have to make sure, okay, I can change this and reword it to make it flow better and be smoother, but I have to be careful not to change the meaning. Because at the end of the day, you want the message you're trying to get across to your reader to be what they hear. You, you want, you know, you don't want to be that game where you say something in a cup and it travels down the line and then it gets distorted at the other end, right? You want the message you're trying to share is the message that they are understanding. And punctuation and grammar does play a part in that. So I really rush through grammar, but are there any other questions? Because sometimes it's nice to just get a refresher on grammar. The thing I like about the Purdue Owl website, too, is that they have a lot of exercises. So you can look up, like, run-on sentences. If you know that you do a lot of run-on sentences because you like long sentences but you can't figure out where to put the punctuation, you can go in, you can read the concepts, and then you can test yourself and see if you got it. And that's good. Because if you're a writer, if you're going to write, then you need to know grammar and punctuation. Do you have to be perfect? No. But you should at least be proficient. You should at least know what a sentence is, right? You should at least know what a fragment is or what a run-on is. And if you don't catch them all, okay, hopefully an editor will catch them. But you want, if you can do it well, you have more control over the end product of your story. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And of what the reader's going to understand from your Let's just look at that chart really quick. Ways to punctuate two independent clauses. So when I say two independent clauses, I'm talking about two clauses that could each, what, if I wanted them to? Stand. They could each stand alone if, I if we wanted them to. Because they have a subject, subject predicate, predicate, complete thought, complete thought, right? Okay. So you can put a period, of course, between those to break up the ideas to give impact. They ate their last meal, period. Then they died, period. Okay, <laughs> no. <laughs> those are kind of good short sentences. You wanna save those short sentences for your knockout punch, right? You, you have your nice long sentences to link together ideas, or first this happened and then this happened, or whatever, but then you wanna save those short sentences. That day, everything changed, period. Think of your story as you are holding the writer by the hand and walking them through um, you're taking them on a journey, right? And so you have to give them enough transitions. And then, before that, a year later, you, you have to give them a sense of time, and this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. But you also don't want them to fall asleep, so you have to vary your sentence length, right? You have long, short, long, short, so that it sounds like da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, ta-ta, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, you, right. you want to give it, you don't want to be, ta -ta, ta -ta, ta -ta, ta -ta, you know, that's too many short sentences, it starts to be weird. But too many long sentences, it feels like you're suffocating. And you lose them, right? right? So another way to do that with the two independent clauses is to have a semicolon and keep those ideas together. Um, some people like to just put a comma, they don't want another word. Well, if you don't want another word, you just want to say your sentence and your other sentence, but join them together, just throw a semicolon in there. 
and you notice that it looks like a comma with a period over it. So just think of it that way. It is a more powerful comma. And its job is to link two independent clauses together. So everybody gets along, because they're both really strong clauses, right? Um, the soldiers marched for four hours straight, semicolon. It was sunset when they arrived back at base. We like having those ideas together. We don't really need any transition words in between, so just throwing a semicolon in there. Now sometimes when you have a list with a lot of commas already in the list, you can throw in a semicolon where you would normally throw in the comma to separate the things. They visited Nome, Alaska, semicolon, Oahu, Hawaii, semicolon, and San Francisco, comma, California, period. If you don't use the semicolons, it looks like they went one, two, three, four, five, six places, right? Right. But if you use those semicolons, you see, right. oh, that's three places. Right. That's the city right. and state, city and right. state, city and state. Right. So it's just helping the reader. You know, always, I'm always thinking, is it clear for the reader? Is the reader understanding this? Colon is a fun punctuation mark because it's a little unusual, but it shows cause and effect or smaller to greater or general to specific. It's kind of like these two ideas are linked. So the soldiers marched for four hours straight, colon, their legs and back ache because they were marching, right? So it's a cause and effect relationship. The fanboys are so that you can join the two independent clauses. You put the comma, then the fanboy. I went outside holding my cat, comma, and the neighborhood dog bit me. Well, both of those things go together. The dog bit me because I had a cat in my arms, right? And the only reason I'm telling you about the cat is because the dog bit me. So you really have to put those two ideas together. But you don't want to clutter up the sentence with a however and therefore and consequently. It's just not that kind of a sentence. So you just put comma and, right? Or comma so could work there too. A conjunctive adverb, that was the one I was telling you about that's really uh, good for showing complex relationships between the two clauses. Before that day, comma, I never had much use for dogs, semicolon, however, comma, a dog saved my life. I want all that together. I, I really feel like all of that idea needs to be together, but there's a lot going on. So I need the however, because I'm saying one thing, but then my whole attitude changed. And that's the point of the sentence is a contrast. So we throw that semicolon, however, comma. And if you look at it, you've got a lot going on in that little sentence. Before that day is a dependent clause that's in front of, I never had much use for dogs, which is a deep independent clause. So before that day, comma, you have the weaker before the stronger. Now I could put a period after dogs, but I want to add this other idea. So I put a semicolon, a conjunctive adverb, a comma, and then my other independent clause. Could that sentence um, go without that first comma before the day I never had much use for a dog? That's a good question because before that day is a prepositional phrase and a lot of people don't put a comma after a prepositional phrase that begins a sentence. I like them. I like to if if it's a weighty, um, if it's a meaningful, and if it's more than two words, I like to put a comma. Um, but you will see that written without the comma sometimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Yeah. Well, let's move on from grammar, but always feel free to ask, like feel free to send me grammar questions or just to Google them and look them up because that's what a lot of us pros do. We have to look stuff up because the English language is so complicated. But what I really want to talk to you about today is editing, the editing and revision process because a lot of, a lot of good souls lose it. <laughs> they just fall away during the editing process. I think writing is hard, it's challenging, you put your heart and soul into it, you turn it in, and then someone gets in there and changes it, and you go, oh no, I did it wrong. I want to drive that thinking from your brain today. So, we all want to do well, or we put hours and hours into something, and we, we think we've got it just perfect, or we think, oh, if they had to change it, it was bad, or it was wrong, or I failed have to not allow that thinking in your brain. It is just not true. And it's the most discouraging thing that writers deal with. I think it is the most discouraging thing writers deal with. So here's my little pep talk. Okay, 
every piece of writing in Calvary Chapel Magazine gets edited. And you guys see, we have, we have teaching pages, we have ads, we have um, testimony stories, we, every single piece of writing, if it's a paragraph, it gets edited by somebody. So first of all, just know that. Not just by one editor, but a team of editors. As a result, many volunteer writers who are new to professional writing often get discouraged when their work is edited. But if you will prepare yourself with a few simple truths, then you can survive the editing process to write another day. <laughs> Every published piece of writing in the world, from newspapers, magazines, television and movie scripts, and web content, gets edited. There is no piece of writing that costs money to distribute or produce that does not first get edited. Why would somebody pay to produce a commercial and just go with the first version of that script? They're going to look at it. They're going to evaluate it. They're going to say, oh, how can we make it shorter and save ourselves some money? Or, hmm, maybe we need to add another line about how great the product is. Or, you know, everything that people put money behind to produce has to go through editing. Because one person is going to, even the person who writes it, they don't have the, always have the ability to look at it from another point of view and make sure that it's cl as clear and as good as it could be. And most pieces go through several editors. That means several stages of change, right? So it doesn't just get changed one time. Every editor can change it. So if it has four editors, it can get changed four times. And then a lot of times it'll go back to you with maybe some questions. Did this happen first or did this happen first? And can you make that clearer? And, and then you have to change it again, right? So then that's five changes. And then sometimes it'll go back to the person who's in charge of that thing, like the ministry leader or the pastor. And then they might have some, oh, can you say this that we started in 1980? And then that gets changed. So, so there's no limit <laughs> to the number of changes that can happen to your piece. And it's not a reflection on you. It's not a, a statement about you that you're a bad writer. That is just the world of writing. And the sooner you can accept that editing is not a reflection on your ability or on your performance or uh, that it's just part of it, you know, it's kind of like sports. In sports, you don't just go out and play the game. You have practices, right? You watch tapes. I don't, I'm not an athlete, but I, you know, I live with someone who loves football, but they watch tapes. They have playbooks. They discuss things. They change the plays. They have coaches. They have, you know, and, and, they, and they have practices and camps and all this stuff, and that's what the editing process is. It's like, Here's the first part. Now let's bring someone else in. Let's coach it along. Let's make that a little better. Let's do this. Let's do that. And get it as good as we can. And then when it comes out, that's game day. You know? That's good. Analogy. And, and so don't get discouraged and think, oh, it should be able to just trot out there and play perfectly without any of that. No, this is not reality, right? I did my master's thesis on J.R.R. Tolkien and his uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy his editors want him to write a sequel to The Hobbit. So he sat down to write another fun adventure story about a hobbit, but he just couldn't do it because he'd already written that. And the world wars were going on and people were dying and his sons were going off to war. And what he had inside of him was an epic. He didn't know that. He took him 11 drafts to figure out that the ring was evil and it would drive the narrative and it must be destroyed to save the world, right? 11 drafts. And he wrote like almost the whole book 11 times and changed it. And it took him seven years, right? And this is a professional guy who has a PhD in linguistics and teaches at Oxford, you know? So don't think that you're going to sit down and write a draft and it's going to be perfect with no changes needed by anyone. It's just not reality. So just know that. Just embrace it. That's the world of writing, right? Okay. That leads to my next point, number two. No one, except Jesus, <laughs> can write perfectly the first time. No one, not even famous professional authors, no one is allowed to be the sole editor of their own work. They're not allowed. The publishing companies will not let you. If they're going to put money behind your book and print it and distribute it and advertise it, you don't edit it. My professional editors are going to edit it, and probably a whole team of them. In fact, few writers would want to. If you read most acknowledgement pages, you know where they say thank you to everybody? Many authors praise or recognize their editors for making their work even better. If you do, just look at your novels that you have at home. 
thank you so-and-so for making this book better. Thank you for catching all my mistakes. Good writers recognize that they need editors, that the editor's job is to make your story what? Better. 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 Yeah, it's a good thing. It's good to get edited. Here at the magazine, even Tom, who was our founder and the editor-in-chief, has his work go through the editing process. The whole process. And I'm going to tell you about our lengthy, complicated process. <laughs> All right, so number three. This is, this is the basics of our editing um, process. Every piece of writing in the magazine is edited for different things. A, spiritual content. We send it to one editor, and her whole job is to read it and say, does this faithfully reveal the character of God alive and working in the world today? Is there anything said or portrayed that could seem to contradict the Bible? Is there anything that could make Calvary Chapel seem cultish or weird to outsiders? Does it glorify God or man? And she's reading this, and she's saying, is there spiritual value to this story? Does this get to the, we've talked about it a bajillion times, the, the heart. spiritual heart of the story, God's heart. Is God's heart in this story? Is that the most important thing in this story? Is it clear? Is it accurate? Is it, you know, so that's her whole thing. She's not looking at grammar. She's not looking at anything but that, right? And it's, we've learned that it's really important to have someone look for that because you get involved in the story and you're like, oh, this is such a great ministry. It's so wonderful. And you write it and you're trying to do all these other things and get your, and then, but we can miss that. It's amazing. Every once in a while it happens. Then we send it to another guy who's looking for accuracy. And this guy is super meticulous. Do, does what we have in the article line up with that ministry's info on their website or in other stories or sources? He's looking at titles, ministry names, dates, histories, purpose and vision. He's looking at all that stuff. If there are conflicting facts or statistics, and sometimes when there's conflicting facts or statistics, it's not your fault. That's what they told you. And you put it down. But see, people don't always remember the exact year or the exact number or whatever. So it's good to double check that stuff. You should double check it yourself with what's out there online, but this guy's going to double check it too. If there are conflicting statistics, statistics are the worst because depending on who's putting them out, they can sort of skew them or twist them or make them sound one way or the other, like the opioid crisis. We have to really look at, okay, what is the source of these statistics? Are they fair? Do they line up with like the government statistics, you know, the expert statistics? Are they way off? Because we don't want to publish something that's obviously very um, biased. We're trying to be accurate and fair in our reporting. And you can find a statistic that says anything, right? So you have to make sure it's solid. So he's, he's checking that too. Where did you get those statistics? Are they reliable? Are they still accurate? Is there anything that could be taken as a conflict, an exaggeration, or an untruth? Why would it be important that we take out anything that could be seen as untrue? It just shows the credibility of, of the actual magazine. One false statement destroys our credibility. <laughs> I always used to get frustrated with TV news when I would cover a story in the newspaper and they would cover a story, they would say whatever. They would say all kind of crazy stuff. La, 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 And I'm like, I didn't look that up. That is not accurate. But I had to have it accurate because mine's in print, right? And your stories are going to be in print. And um, there's all kind of legal stuff that goes on when something's in print. And there it is for all the world to see. You say, well, I didn't mean it that way. Or I didn't say that exactly. No, it's in there. And we're a spiritual publication. And we're trying to tell these stories and show that God is alive and working. So one false statement, and someone can say, oh, that whole thing is a lie. They're exaggerating. They're making up stories to make their church look good or to make people believe there's a God when there isn't. So we have to be almost OCD <laughs> in making sure that everything is airtight. Then we have someone who reads it. Usually this is Tom. Capturing the reader. Does each story make sense to the reader? Does it keep them engaged throughout the whole piece? Does it drag in any spots or seem dull or redundant? Is it unclear? Is it confusing? Is it helpful, inspiring, instructive, or interesting? Right? Because it can be helpful, inspiring, instructive, or interesting. And a lot of times it's just adding a sentence or, you know, something you already know, but you just forgot to put it in there. And, and can you see as we go through, and we're talking about the different facets of, that it's helpful to have someone else come in and look at this 
and they're looking for this specific thing, right. and this one over here is looking for this specific thing. You can see how it can make it better. With is that each. typical how the editing process works with groups of editors and just mm -hmm. one thing? That's how it works here, because with our kind of story, we need that. We need a spiritual read. We need, you know, all this stuff. At the newspaper where I worked, you would have, um, it would go from sort of like specific to general. So you'd write a piece and you'd have your local editor read it who was familiar with that area. And then he would send it on to like maybe the city editor and then the city editor is looking at it. And they're, they're all looking for things like, does it flow? The first person's looking for, is it accurate? And does it line up with everything else we know about this? And then the city editor is looking at, does it make sense to someone who's not familiar with it? Does it flow? Are there any errors? And then the and then you'll have like the, the managing editor look at it and he's looking from a big picture perspective too, but he might find a grammar problem, but usually he's looking for what is what is the message of this piece? Why are we putting this in? Do, does it say anything? <laughs> does it have a point? That's from working at a city newspaper. And I saw that each editor, they really want the story to be clear and accurate. Um, but they did kind of have their own things they were looking for too. And they would edit it and write notes and send it back to me to kind of show me, you better not make this mistake again. Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned to be accurate, to look things up, to make sure the flow is there. Flow. This is usually what I'm reading a story for. Does the piece have a unified message? Does it flow well from one idea to another? Remember we talked about taking the reader on the journey, right? Um, does it make sense overall? Is it the right lead in place? Is, is that the lead we want for this story? Is that lead showing God's heart? Is that lead interesting? Is it clear? Is it kind of sterile and boring? Too many speakers, it's like too many, too many people in the room talking at the same time. Because the reader can usually remember about three people. I'm quoting Cortez, I'm quoting Elena, I'm quoting Tom. And, the, and we can kind of go back and forth from those. But then if I start adding like, you know, Ronnie and Lindsay and Dave and Chris and by the end of it, and then I say Tom again, they say, who's Tom? <laughs> Depending on how much you have to say and how, how long the story is, you can really only have so many people quoted. Or sometimes you need to keep all of Elena's quotes here and then move on to Cortez and then move on to Tom, explaining each time who each person is and why they're suddenly showing up here and talking in the middle of our story, right? Should anything be moved or cut or rearranged to make better sense? For who? For the reader. reader. Can it be shortened? Does anything need to be added, right? So this is sort of an overall kind of a flow. And then of course, um, we have grammar and punctuation, and a couple of us look for that. Grammar and punctuation, spelling, subject verb agreement, punctuation, etc. No, these are just a few of the things that our editing team looks for. Each editor is required to make changes that he or she sees fit, to ask the writer clarifying questions, to correct errors, to add important information, etc. That's their job. That's the editor's job. If they don't do that, they're not doing their job. So if you give me a piece, and I'm feeling kind of tired, or I don't want to hurt your feelings, and I'm like, well, I mean, it mostly makes sense, just it's fine. I'm not really doing my job, right? If I don't stop and look at the piece and say, okay, does it have a spiritual heart? Does it flow well? Is this the best we can do with this information? Is this the most interesting article we could write about this ministry? You know, and sometimes there have been times we've had to just, nope, we don't have it yet. We need to inter interview a few more people. I'm in the middle of that myself. Um, I've interviewed six people for a story, and I still didn't have a changed life. I've had a lot of people talking about how all these lives were changing. I had a couple people change a little bit of their opinion, but not a changed life. And I wrote it up because it was deadline, and I said, Tom, here it is, but it doesn't have the changed life. And the whole point of this ministry is that it's all these teenagers are getting saved. <laughs> and he said, Christmas, we can't. We can't write the story without the changed life. Otherwise, we just have a bunch of people talking about how great and how these lives are changing. But we're not proving it. You know? So I had to keep looking and thank the Lord because he's on our side. Hey, <laughs> Finally found one and interviewed him. So now we have a changed life in the story, which we really needed because that's the whole point of that ministry. Do you have a question? Yeah. In, in writing, should the writer think of these opponents while writing? That's Should a really good question. Should be self-editing 
while writing? That's a really good question. And I was going to talk about, I would call that revision. I like the word self-editing. We talked before about how you have the, this, the part of the process of writing where you're creating and you're getting the ideas out and you're getting the what's inspiring, what's interesting, what's important. And there's that part where you, you can't be thinking about all this stuff. You have to put all this stuff aside, flow and grammar, and you just have to put all that aside so that you can get into the heart of the story and God's heart and the spiritual, you know, and, right? But then you have to, and you guys are all going to be different, but you have to give yourself either a day or a week or whatever to put it down, go off and forget about it, come back to it, and now look for spiritual content, accuracy, capturing the reader, flow, grammar, yeah. And really, you should think of all these things before and, and, and tweak it and change it as much as you can right. before you send it off. And that's a really good point because you'll have more control. And why is it better for the writer to do that, to make these changes? Because you interviewed everyone. You know the nuances. You know the subtlety. You know if they're really, like, for example, um, a lot of times when I'm writing a story about evangelism, sometimes the people will they'll say, but you have to be gentle with people. You can't get in people's faces, you know. You and I understand that nuance. So everything I'm quoting and everything I'm saying is I'm trying to convey that. Well, an editor might not know that because they weren't there for the interview, right? So they might change it, and it sounds a little more abrupt, or, or it doesn't have that. And and so you know, not just the facts, but the, the heart behind a lot of the quotes, the the meaning, the context of a lot of the quotes. Because you're going to interview someone and have 10 pages of interview notes, or five pages, but then you have to pull out a quote and put it in a story. And you have to make sure that it's not out of context or that it's clear the way that that person meant it, right? So that's why it's better if you make the changes. And that's why I like to send the story back to the writer after we've edited it, just to make sure that it still has that original intent of those people who said those quotes and of the pastor who, like, of their vision that they had and it doesn't come across as cold or, you know, contradictory to what they meant. If you can do a read and look for all these things at once or if you have to sort of like first just do a spiritual read and then put it down, right? And then do a accuracy where you go and you're just looking up facts, you're Googling stuff, right? Um, capturing the reader, maybe you give it to your husband or wife or a friend and say, can you just read this and tell me if it's interesting to you? Yeah. You know? And be very honest. You know? <laughs> Don't just say it's good. And flow. You can actually do help with flow with just using transition words. Like a year later, comma. Um, on the other hand, comma. Or echoing the same thought, comma. Mm -hmm. Where you're just helping your reader see the the relationship between paragraphs as you're switching speakers or as you're, you're or oh, five years went by? Oh, I have to, five years later, right? Um, so flow, just transition words, if you want to write transition words out beside flow. These are the things the editors have to do this. If they don't do this, they're not doing their job. You see my little star. Sometimes it's a compliment to get a lot of feedback, as that may mean we like your story and are seeking to expand it or give it more room in the magazine. I'm running into this with our briefs. Our briefs, we like them to be around 300 words, and I have a writer working on some briefs, and she's like, that story is so amazing! Here's all these testimonies, here's all these things! And they were going, well, <laughs> can we make this a page? Hmm, do we have room for a page? Well, if we are, I'm going to ask her a whole bunch more questions. Well, now you have to give me this, and now you have to tell me this, and now you have to find another quote, and now you have to... So sometimes questions are good, because it means, ooh, tell me more, tell me more. This stuff is especially true for here at the magazine, because we are a Christian publication, and we're writing about the things that God is doing. And you cannot do this stuff without God. And you are not going to do this stuff without spiritual warfare or opposition. And I don't know what that's going to look like for you, but I know for a lot of writers... It, um, they struggle with discouragement. They struggle with, oh, she changed that. I should have known to change that. I'm a bad writer. I just don't write anything else for you guys. <laughs> well, no, come back. <laughs> you know, like, everybody gets stuff changed. It's okay. Um, but, I mean, that's probably the biggest thing is just people getting discouraged. And you can see how the enemy could throw those thoughts at you. And he doesn't want this 
magazine to go out. He doesn't want these stories of changed lives to go out. He doesn't want them to be the best they can be. He doesn't want them to start out with the 17-year-old boy who gave his life to Jesus and walked away from drugs and alcohol. He doesn't want that in there, right? So he's just a discourager and a liar. Okay, so number one, edits are not a sign of failure. Everybody say it. Edits Edits are are not a sign sign of of failure. failure. Edits don't mean failure, they just mean change, right? Expect edits. They are coming, (laughs) period, short sentence. No one will be disappointed in you if they have to edit or change your piece. We all assume that there will be changes to every piece. If you made a mistake, right, let's say you put the wrong year or you got the title wrong, take note and learn from it. That's how professional writers develop into better writers. Not everything that we change is something you could have foreseen, right, or you would have known, oh, no, let's, we'll, we'll just change it this way, it's a little clearer. But if you make mistakes, if you get a title wrong or a name spelling wrong, or uh, just, just stop and learn from it, say, how could I have prevented that? How could I have made sure that that name was spelled correctly? How could I have made sure I got the title right? I always check the staff page on church websites, always. Because even sometimes when you ask people their title, sometimes they get embarrassed or shy. They're like, oh, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I just serve here. I just work with the children. And then I have to go to the staff page and get, get their official title because we have to have it for the magazine. And sometimes name spellings. You might think John Smith, everybody knows how to smell that. Well, you don't know. Does he have a Y and an E at the end? I don't know, right? So staff pages are great. And Facebook is great, too, because if you can find that person's Facebook page, let's say you find their name spelled wrong, spelled two different ways on the church website. It can happen, because who's usually making church websites? Volunteers, right? And if someone has a tricky last name, they might switch two letters around by accident. You go to the person's Facebook page, most of the time they know how to spell their own name, (laughs) right? So it's a nice way to double check. If I have a funny name, I always try to find them on Facebook. Number two, be aware that the enemy is against your service here. And you might think that I'm, this sounds weird or odd. Well, we're just talking about writing articles. Okay, I wish it was that simple. But once you start doing stuff for Jesus, the stakes are higher, the intensity can, can go up, right? And you might not even know that it's spiritual warfare. You know, you, that thought might come to you, you are a terrible writer. Oof, don't ever write anything. You might think, oh yeah, that's true. I, I would suggest that that's probably the enemy throwing that thought in your head. It could be your own self-doubt. It could be your own negative talk. But I think a lot of times it's the enemy. You know, He's very crafty. He's not going to say, this is Satan. I'm here to discourage you. He's going to say, oh, you are a failure. See, they had to change that sentence. You should have known better. Right? Ooh, he's slimy. So just know, the enemy is against your service here. He will discourage you, wound your pride, we all have it, make you doubt yourself, and try to get you to quit. You should only quit serving or writing if the Lord instructs you to. Don't listen to your emotions or discouraging thoughts. I know this sounds preachy, like you're all grown-ups and you should know this, but I'm telling you, every writer I've worked with, every single one, has felt like just this desire to quit or just this discouragement. Okay, number three. Pray, pray, and pray. You are fighting against the world, the flesh, and the devil as you serve in this ministry. And really that's true of any ministry. Any ministry where lives are being changed or you're sharing the gospel, you're, you have opponents to that. Right? So the world is arguing with you, tell, saying a bunch of lies. Oh no, teenagers can drink and they can have sex before marriage and it's okay. You know? And then you have the flesh, which is just how people feel about things. And in your own flesh, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I shouldn't say that because that's kind of harsh. And, you know, and, and then you have the devil who's a liar and very crafty. So you have all these things uh, fighting against you as you serve in this ministry. And because of the nature of our work, the opposition is more subtle. We may believe we are a rotten writer, or that someone on staff hates our work. They hate it. Oh, they hate it. They hated my story. I don't know how many people. I would say, I did not hate your story. We edit everybody's story, okay? There's nothing in me that hates anything about your story. 
Um, but it is always the enemy, our own discouragement, plaguing us. Pray before you write, while you interview. Sometimes, you know, when we interview people, we're asking them really personal questions. Like I had to ask that poor teenage boy, what were you doing before you became a Christian? He's like, my name going to be in this? You know, <laughs> and we had to have a discussion about that. You know, because he was about to share, like, deeply personal stuff with me. And so I'm, I start praying, just quietly, you know, even if it's a short prayer. Lord, just please help him. Show him what to say. You know, help him let down his guard if you want him to, you know. I, I confess to you guys, I think, the second class that the Lord has shown me, yeah, Chris, since you've been doing this for 20 years, but don't get cocky. Don't think, oh, I know how to do this. I don't really need to pray. I'm just going to write it. It's a spiritual story. It's about the Lord. It's for the Lord. It's about his people. It's, you know what I'm saying? Like, I better invite the Lord into this. Pray while you revise, because it's really hard to change your own stuff. And pray while you answer editor's questions, right? Um, I'll confess this to you. I still sort of flare up if somebody says, you know, I don't think you really caught it. What? Yes, I did. Like Christmas, be quiet and listen because this person is just telling you to try to help the story be better. So calm down your little pride. Calm down your, you know, your arguments. You know, put those aside and listen. Listen to what the editors are saying. It's hard. I mean, you think after 20 years, I'd be like, oh, okay. No, you don't understand the story at all. So I know. This is a spiritual work. You have to include prayer.